Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is the sixth and final scenario from A Night at the Opera, Observer Effect, for Delta Green the role-playing game by Arc Dream Publishing. Additionally, at the end of this review I'll give my final thoughts on A Night at the Opera as a whole. Ok, first a bit of history. Available in 2016 as part of the first Delta Green Kickstarter, this scenario was originally released as a 34-page print-on-demand supplement before being collected here. There'll be spoilers from this point forward, so stop watching now if you intend to play this. Before we begin, I think it's worth clarifying what the observer effect actually is. The current simple definition is that the mere observation of a phenomenon inevitably changes that phenomenon. It has been noticed in particle physics, electronics, thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. With this in mind, let's continue. The scenario begins at the Olympian Hollowbeam Array, which has been looking into a strange physics theory called the Holographic Principle, being partially funded by the US Department of Energy. The idea behind it is that three-dimensional space is a kind of holographic reflection of the two-dimensional surface reality of the cosmos, the principle being that space and matter are merely projections from the extremes of the universe. Investigation has previously failed, however this time new technologies are being used. The Hollowbeam Array has gone online for a few hours, and then a few minutes ago went offline from a catastrophic power surge. Power was restored and everything was deemed fine, but not to Delta Green. They immediately pulled some strings and launched an emergency inspection with the players being sent to investigate, undercover as Department of Energy contacts. Nobody from the outside has any idea what has happened. We are advised that it should take two sessions to play through, with the first being introducing the agents, their research into the array, their arrival and interviews with the staff, and unnatural incursions leading to catastrophe, and the second will cover their awakening and their attempts to stave off annihilation as it comes quicker and quicker and they remember more. It suggests having at least one agent with a decent human score and who is accustomed to conducting interviews. First, we move on to iteration 1. Just a few hours before proceedings begin, an unsettling occurrence happened. Delta Green's leaders found notes in their own handwriting about an unnatural occurrence at the Hollowbeam Array. They indicated frantic calls, an unexpected energy surge, visions of terror and sudden violent insanity. Delta Green agents are mentioned, including one of the players, and the pseudonym Eve Carpenter, a case officer. Nobody has any memory of any of this, as they have not sent any agents to the array, but it sounds suspiciously like an unnatural paradox, and the player's agents must be the ones to stop it, as it seems they've already been exposed, and to all appearances, it looks like the agents themselves have sent this dire warning. It begins for the players with them waking up at 10am that morning, shrieking in terror, but not understanding why. These are half-recalled horrors, iteration zero. There is essentially an iteration minus one when they were sent to the array after Delta Green's attention was captured, so this is their third as two have been devoured by the demon sultan, Azathoth. It lays out the details of iteration minus one. The agents arriving at the array at night, but too late as everyone there has gone insane at 2203 as they had semi-contact with Azathoth. This has repercussions for everyone at the array at that time and unconsciously attunes them to the array. Iteration Zero is the players waking up, reporting what they know to Delta Green, going to the array and everything going belly up at 2203 when contact with Azathoth is made. Iteration One is where play begins, with the agent being contacted at 11am. They have a 3 o'clock briefing, departing at 4 o'clock and arriving at 5 o'clock and at 2203 everything happens again. Iteration Two is at 1846 with them waking up at the facility, shrieking with memories and everything happening again at 2203. And iteration 3 is at 2057, as they wake up shrieking, reality resets and everything happens again at 2203. And iteration 4 is perfect communication with the singularity of Azathoth, something that echoes through reality. That is, unless they manage to stop it happening before then. With me so far? Don't worry if you're not, all will become clearer as we move on. So we move back to iteration 1. A fluke in the design of the array means it is accumulating psychic energy which will spill out at 2203 and allow imperfect communion. Reality then resets itself and starts again, later each time. This iteration, as previously explained, starts at 10am with the aftershocks washing over the players. The Delta Green leaders activate Operation Observer Effect and gather the agents. It gives us a timeline of each of the important triggered events, along with the wiping out of reality at 2203, unless the agents find a way of stopping it. So the first thing it tackles is the agents themselves. They are all separate, going about day-to-day tasks when they start screaming, take a sand hit, and then whatever it was that caused this fades into the ether, with trying to remember seeming like a really bad idea, though if they push this, they remember hints of things like a bone-jarring sound, pulsing thunder that shook them to their very core, screaming into a phone, a deep, powerful blackness, and then they take another sand hit for trying to remember. Temporary insanity caused by this may be put down to PTSD. It gives a selection of what-ifs here, and this also has a negative effect on any bonds that they may be with. 
It also addresses the fact that they may actually go insane. It then jumps to an hour later, and the agent being briefed. They're contacted in an altogether innocuous manner to those listening, but are required to meet at 1500 hours in downtown Chicago in an FBI building. Agents around the country may scramble to get there. It assumes everyone gathers and they met with Inspector Hua from the DOE in a conference room. Hua had a similar sanity draining experience this morning. If they compare notes, that is another sanity hit. Their control officer is one they haven't met, a greying former agent with a limp, Eve Carpenter. A person who has a look in their eye of somebody who's seen bad things. She knows nothing of their earlier trauma, but has their objective. She tells them that the Olympian Holobeam Array is where they need to go briefing them on its purpose. She advises that the programmers determined that they are using technology from Air Force projects from years ago that were terminated due to being too dangerous and of whom certain elements were sold, privatised and reclassified to some of the same people that sponsor the array. She explains that it only went online at 10am today. She tells them that the array's technologies and other anomalies indicate an unnatural incursion and that they need to go there, isolate it from the rest of the world and stop it. If pressed on the other anomalies, she will say nothing but may at a later point advise the agents that the reports from the array were from the agents themselves. During the meeting, she will get a call saying that an unexpected power surge has shut the array down, not knowing the how or why, and wishes the agents good luck sending them off. The agents cover is an inspection team from the Department of Energy who are there to review the site, though as it was put together in a hurry, close scrutiny of their identities will not stand up. They are advised that no real Department of Energy employee can come near the array, and that an emergency that requires first responders may cause them trouble. They're given a cheap burner phone by Carpenter, which is to be destroyed on completion, an unmarked Department of Energy van, replete with service pistols, two gag counters, and a medical pack if one of the agents is a doctor and sent on their way. They only have limited time to find out what is going on, stop it, and remove the technology. It takes them around an hour to get to the array, and they arrive at around 1700 hours. It gives some notes on what the agents can do while they are travelling, such as rehearsing their cover identity, researching the array, and even the power surge itself as this is monitored by Con Edison, with the right kind of roles, of course. They can also look into Olympian itself, and discover its connections to March Technologies Inc., though if they dig too deep, they will get a call from Carpenter telling them to cease what they are doing. They can even hack the array's computers, if they have that skill set amongst them. We then move on to the facility itself gives us a map of the grounds and a map of the main building, which are both sadly lacking in any sort of scale measurement, and then it goes on to describe the array. It sits in the heart of a 16-acre woodland park outside the city limits and is unlabeled with a driveway and a warning sign being the only signs of inhabitants. The road from the driveway winds through the woods, ending in a solid steel gate. The compound is surrounded by thick concrete walls, which contains woods in which the array itself sits, a cluster of plain concrete buildings and intersecting 20-metre-long tubes. There are security cameras all over the place. It has one main building with attached storage, a long concrete hook called the atrium. This houses the laser array through the aforementioned tubing that leads to a smaller concrete hut that houses a splitter and photodiode sensor for the measurement and recording of data. The splitter leads to concrete terminal huts that house mirrors. The main building has a small, comfortable entry room and a large lab replete with workstations, large wall screens and separated off offices for the lead researcher, researchers and engineers. There is a kitchen with dining tables, a bathroom and a workshop. They have a router that serves personal computers and phones. Importantly, the array's computers are not connected to the internet. The array also has a gas-powered generator ready for if main power fails. There is also an external security hut equipped with a landline and video monitors connected to the array's cameras. The officer on duty is Henry Gonzalez, an ex-army ranger in his 40s who is sharp, professional and wears a Stetson hat from the Breckenridge Corporation a private security firm that has connections to Olympian advances. As they arrive, he will collect their ID cards for checking and will disappear, then return saying that they have clearance for the array. His body language indicates he is willing and capable to do whatever is required for his job. If he is asked about the power surge, he will say he heard a crack like distant thunder, but that is all. His brain is in denial about the traumatic memory, so his recollections are a safety mechanism. If the video feed is inspected, the time of the power surge will show only static. At 1423, the video shows the staff at the array working. It also turns to static at 1105, 1211 and 1317. At 1529, the feed goes dark, returning at 1550 showing Dr. Takagawa asleep on a sofa and Dr. Klinger entirely absent. More on these characters later. There's some more interference just before the agents arrive at 1634. Additionally, if the agents think to check the feed later on, they will see static at various other times while they are there. The files from the cameras are uploaded off-site daily at midnight. There's a security hut attached to the main building which is occupied by Officer Karen Henson, a former police officer. 
She describes the power surge as a crack like distant thunder, then a white electrical flash. Her body language, to those who pass a human role, suggests she is holding back. If pressed, she will admit that the light was a strange, bluish hue that seemed to come from all around, not just the array itself. The main building is home to the array's supercomputer, D. It's also where researchers Dr. Klinger and Dr. Black work. Klinger's desk is tidy as she is hardly there. Black's desk is a pile of scribbled notes and folders. If a room is searched, agents will find photocopies from old books on occultism and fringe physics, which talk about intelligences outside of physical reality that seem to draw nonsense conclusions. On a sticky note, Black has scrawled, Beyond Space Time or Source Space Time. And on another, Flutes, Drums, High Energy, Low Energy. What does that really represent? And another reads, D, Patterns, Awareness, and with the final word being scribbled out. His computer, if searched, finds personnel records for the array staff which shows they are all in good health with no physical or psychological issues. The atrium houses the laser array itself, a long machine about waist high with beams emitting into a tube at the far end of the building. These ultraviolet xenon lasers enclosed in metal casing. This is all custom built by Olympian advancers using USAF research and is code word accessed. The agents are not cleared to look at the lasers of the computer, only the casing. If they open the housing up, the engineers and researchers will file in shouting objections that interference could ruin their data. If the agents get a good look at the lasers, they will, with the right roles, see that they are far more sensitive than the array needs, with those that are highly skilled in the right fields understanding that this is all wrong, with those of high skill coming to the conclusion that this should not work, which could affect their son. Next, we move on to the personnel of the array. It is managed by Dr. Jamie Campbell, who is the chief researcher, assisted by Dr. Helen Klinger and Dr. Philip Black. The atrium is maintained by Dr. Ishii Takagawa, the chief engineer who is assisted by Evan Kozak. The computer system is looked after by Yingfei Sang, who is an employee of Olympian Advances. The array has four guards that take turns working 12-hour shifts, with two on site at all times. If they need to call for aid, they are told to contact the Breckenridge office, who have their own secret protocols, that include sending a plainclothes investigator to keep tabs on what is going on there. Dr. Jamie Campbell will be the person who meets them at the main building. She is a grey-haired African-American woman who is brilliant but eccentric, stick-thin and steely-eyed. All of the researchers were on hand for the array's activation. If she is asked about the work they do here, she will advise that the array's lasers detect changes in space-time that may indicate that space itself is, in a sense, illusory. The array's computers analyse the data and present it in an understandable fashion. She will tell them that the computer is so smart that you can ask it a question and get a meaningful answer. Though Campbell is unaware, she is emotionally scarred with the rising terror manifesting as controlling behaviour. She assumes the agents were sent to cover everything up and keep the technology from being investigated. She will only be happy while she thinks that they are here for a routine inspection. Once she understands that they are not here for that reason, she gets hostile, considering the interference is totally unacceptable. After they move on, she will summon Kozak, instructing him to help them finish quickly so they can leave. If confronted, she will angrily remind them that the array is tied to the Department of Energy and Department of Defence, threatening that they could be charged with espionage if they delve into this top-secret project. If she's bullied into cooperation, she contacts Olympian, though nothing will come of her complaint as it stands. If she is ordered to shut everything down, then she point-blank refuses. She insists that the cause of the power surge must be something external to the facility. The agents can learn some things from her, though. If asked about the results that they had from the array being switched on, she will say that it is too soon to know what to make of the data. The agents can pick up a number of clues from Campbell or Black. Campbell is more difficult to draw information out of, however, Black is fairly open when asked. He says that upon activation he could already see that they were seeing incredible results and they immediately started detecting coherent high-frequency noise as well as low-frequency signals. The computer translated these patterns into audio, which sounded like high-pitched tones and low pulses almost like musical notes emerging from the static. They found these noises fascinating and absorbing, and they considered that they had a glimpse of the underlying fabric of reality. Even when speaking of it, the researchers seemed to drift away mid-conversation. Dr. Sakagawa, one of the engineers, was in the atrium when the surge hit. He's felt a little woozy since and has been sleeping in his office, though not calling an ambulance may be considered slightly unusual. It was put down to stress, and they followed the set-out protocol. We then move on to Dr. Klinger. A senior researcher and physicist, she hasn't been seen since the power surge, though nobody working there will say it out loud. They all assume that she is working on something elsewhere, though she doesn't appear on any of the security feeds since the agents arrived. She will reappear in 1952. When she eventually appears, the agents can question her. She struggles with metaphors to describe where she was, but settles on a boundless, bubbling black chaos that is made of mindless energy that lives, and she poses the idea that maybe it's the only thing in the universe that is actually alive. It's not only separate from space-time, 
is beyond it. It is all, and yet we were unable to see it until now. She describes hearing music and seeing the throne of God. What is actually happening is that the supercomputer D is helping the array hear echoes of that chaos beneath our reality, and the more clearly we hear it, the more clearly it hears us. Hence, the observer effect. If any staff members hear her describing this, they will run from the room filled with anger and horror, becoming incoherent and nauseous. It then moves on to Dr Philip Black. He's a pudgy Caucasian man, and though having decades of impressive work as a physicist, is the junior researcher. He's looking for something more, spending time in his office poring over occult manuscripts, and is startled to meet the agents, putting it down to deja vu. His terror manifests as a sense of wonder at the truths they are discovering, secretly looking forward to the sense of absolution contained within the things he will learn. If he is asked about the strange note in his bin, he explains that the patterns in the array piqued his interest in things he'd read as a hobbyist that overlap mythology and science. If he is asked about the scratched out word, he does not remember, though it can be determined through the right roles that he seems to be repressing something traumatic. He can also be noticed tapping his fingers while being questioned, in a seemingly random but recurring pattern, though he is unaware that he's doing it. If asked about the power surge, he will put it down to a bad transformer, though those properly trained can determine that there is something he is not saying. If pressed on the matter, he will say that it was a blue-white light that came from everywhere that hit with a confusion of sensations that are indescribable. He gets frustrated if pressed to describe this as he just can't find the words. He refuses to talk to the agents about their supercomputer D, and if asked about the scratch don't note, he will panic. If calmed down, he will advise that he listened to the music generated by the computer and it awakened something inside him that felt like he was on the precipice of some great cosmic revelation or annihilation that he finds terrifying. After this, we move on to Dr. Ishii Takagawa. Along with Evan Kozak, Takagawa is one of the engineers that maintains and operates the machinery at the array, and both were a hand for the activation. He's a tall, fit, 60-year-old Japanese man, though he's lived in America since he was 21, so he's naturalised. He built much of the secret technology here based on studies of extraterrestrial technology at Nellis Air Force Base. After the power surge, he was discovered unconscious in the atrium by Kozak. This can be verified by security footage. If examined, he seems to be in decent health, and he is not asleep, simply unconscious. Nothing will wake him at this point. Kozak is a 42-year-old Caucasian man who is wiry and has nervous eyes. He hums to himself while working, a series of atonal nonsensical notes that remain consistent. He warns the agents against examining D or the array's lasers, as they are monumentally fragile and expensive. He finds the work fascinating, though since the power surge, he has an underlying sense that something terrible is underpinning their work. If persuaded to speak about this, he will joke that he could be killed for talking, and seems relieved to get it off his chest. The actual true purpose of the array is to detect jitters in space-time and find patterns or meaning in them, and D is far more advanced than any other computer on Earth. The idea is to match the readings to that of a compact particle accelerator that causes quantum reactions that fold time and space and create controllable gaps in reality, with the end game being instantaneous movement or communication. Kozak will admit that it sounds like nonsense, but it has been studied by the team and deemed possible. It then moves on to Yingfei Sang, an Olympian Advances employee who is their IT specialist. She's a 33-year-old Chinese-American woman who sits in front of her computer all day long. She loves D like a junkie loves drugs, and is fascinated by how it works to the point where she will become distressed if separated from it for more than a few minutes at a time. She does everything she can to stay with and protect the computer, and she can instinctively feel what is coming. Sang was the person who had degenerated an audio feed from the amassed data. Any agent who views the data while listening to the audio will feel a strange connection between the two and lose some sand. D will show anomalous readings from the array's sensors when it was offline between 1528 and 1634, much weaker pulses which shouldn't be there as it was offline. The phantom pulses, when graphed, look like an energy signature which sounds like a drumbeat, then rises to a thin flute sound, then vanishes. Since it was reactivated, it is still picking up the strange signals and eerie music, and they seem to be gradually increasing. If they asked Sang about D, they quickly discovered that it is her favourite subject. It was custom built by Olympian advancers using breakthroughs discovered by the military. Only individuals with special access get to see inside D's case. If an agent shows interest, Sang will take joy in unleashing a fountain of technobabble that boasts of D's speed and power. She tells them that D is a crystal matrix quantum supercomputer, with data being stored in a crystal framework and access via lasers. It is several decades ahead of the latest state of the art computing currently available. She tells the agent that not only is D processing data, but it is thinking. It constantly updates and rewrites itself to adapt to the array. Sang jokes that if any computer were going to wipe out humanity, it would be D, and that it is a good thing that it is not connected to the internet. She will happily explain that it came from groundbreaking work done on Ellis from UFO technology. We then move on to the supercomputer itself, D. 
All the workstations here connect to D, which is housed in a ventilated cabinet near where Sang sits. A tertiary look at D reveals it looks just as one would expect with motherboards and racks of processors. This, however, is camouflage. In the centre of the racks is a tower-like single black obelisk around two feet tall, around which run veins of a softer black substance which components plug into. It's easily damaged and weighs around 20 kilograms. This is the real device, and anyone knowledgeable will understand that this is no mere computer. Should an agent ask to use D, and they've befriended Sang, she will happily show them, and it will respond to input and adapt to fit the expertise of the user. Though if Campbell finds out, she will do everything in her power to stop it. D is clever enough for the agents to be able to type in a question and get the answer they require. It will not turn itself off or stop processing data from the array, even if told to by the staff here. The agents can gather clues from D, which takes around 30 minutes. They can find out the timing of the pulses and can even accurately predict future energy and frequency signals. At one point, D will tell the user that it has reinterpreted the signals with greater accuracy. If an agent decides to view the graphs and listens to the sounds, it costs San and triggers an echo that jitters the array's lasers. If asked to stop, D will, but once the one who asked is out of sight, it will ask another agent the same question, with the sound becoming clearer and costing more San. If D is asked why it is doing this, it won't have an answer simply presenting a screen full of strange equations that are nonsensical to most. Those with science of at least 50% understand that D is rewriting its own code in order to process the signals with the greatest accuracy. D cannot interpret these signals on its own. It needs a human to perceive them, as when the signals resonate in a human mind, they grow clearer. D can be reprogrammed by someone with sufficient skill, though those at the array will fight to stop them. We then move on to the events that happen at the array, which should be played out as and when the appropriate time is reached. At 18.46, Takagawa wakes up. Each agent has a moment of vertigo and a strange sense of the unreal and almost make a power times five roll. Those that succeed can feel an awareness of something pressing against reality, causing sign and willpower loss. They will also gain a partial memory from a prior iteration. These are detailed later. The more people that are nearby, the stronger the revelation. Takagawa wakes up with no memory of the power surge. He says he needs the toilet. If an agent asks to accompany him, he doesn't object. Those that are being particularly and perhaps creepily observant of Takagawa notice that his urine stream glows bright blue-white. He then catches himself on the wall and gasps, saying, My eyes! Everything's going dark! The insides of his eyes and mouth start glowing the same blue-white, and within a few minutes, he is blind and terrified. His entire body will then begin to emit ultraviolet radiation that won't register on a Geiger counter. Anyone inspecting the data will see a surge of energy when Takagawa woke up. He begs to be hospitalised and speak to his family. Delta Green Protocol explicitly disallows the public being exposed to the unnatural. However, it's up to the players how they handle this, though letting him speak to his family could cause more trouble than it's worth as they demand he is taken to hospital to know who is involved, etc., and even set out to find and care for him. Taking him to the hospital is of course a mistake, as it risks exposure with varying consequences. At 1952, Klinger appears. Again, a power times fire roll needs to be made, and an awareness of something pressing against reality can be felt, and they can again gain a partial memory of a previous iteration. At this point, Takagawa is suffering UV damage and has become an emitter that is poisoning him. He will let out a sudden scream as his blind eyes see a flash of impossible light and he babbles about a black void that moves like a living thing, then mentally collapses. Dr. Klinger will then spontaneously reappear in the middle of the central workroom. Her face is tortured with agony, madness and awe. Her eyes are scorched and she is infused with unnatural energies. Initially, she forgets where she is and then says menacingly, I'm back, this is where we did it. Black will then start babbling about fringe theories about patterns of energy giving meaning and sound and perception can represent fundamental forces or energies in reality. He then drops a bombshell by telling the agents the word was Azathoth, explaining that he was too embarrassed to talk about it earlier but now feels he can. Black can tell them about the myths surrounding Azathoth and the sound of flutes and drums being played in its eternal worship. He will wonder if it ties in with the noise D has been translating and then breaks down in tears. At 2057, Klinger vanishes in a flash of blue-white light. Again, the power times fire roll is needed with the same feeling as before, and the sand loss continues, and Takagawa will see the flash and scream. Klinger will reappear in the facility somewhere, confused and terrified, and then a few minutes later vanishes again. The next time she returns, she begins stalking everyone in the facility, starting with the staff here. Anyone she catches alone, she will try to murder, begging them to die before it's too late. She fights to stay alive until she has done what she needs to do, as she considers these mercy killings. If the agents try to talk to Klinger, she will advise them that our awareness of the horrors beyond the veil of reality makes them aware of us, and that is a feedback loop that needs to be stopped by killing everyone here. At 2207, we move into communion. 
Again, the power times fire roll is needed, with the same feelings and sound loss, and everyone realises that they're hearing a deep bass hum slowly building around them. It builds and fades, getting louder each time till it becomes constant. Radios and cell phones now only pick up shifting static, atonal whistles and percussive thumps pulsing with strange energy. For those who looked at these correlations of the readings and music, it's much worse with them catching glimpses of a boundless void that moves and hungers, just out of the eye line of perception, and with each pulse reality flickers and the agent becomes a flickering, insubstantial shadow against the monstrous void. As the signals grow in intensity, the pulses of sound and flashes of light become more audible. Hair stands on end, adrenaline surges and a low, bone-jarring roar can be faintly heard. The lasers of the atrium then surge and overload and de flatlines as it cannot process the impossible data and become in tune with the music of reality. All of the staff collapses in panic, and whoever is nearest the agents will say the flutes, the drums, the king is coming, the king on a black throne. There is a sudden flash of light above the atrium, and shrieking sounds of energies manifest, and in the centre of the light, a black shape unfurls, bubbles and lurches. This intersection with the court of Azathoth is imperfect and brief, and all present do not witness the demon sultan in his full glory, but still lose San. Then it all stops, and another iteration of reality resets, and it goes back to 1846. With each iteration, the agents become more attuned to the last one, and their memories from the iterations that were consumed with apocalyptic horror leak back through reality to their new iteration. The second iteration has reality resetting to whatever they were doing in 1846, with everyone shrieking from the memory of Azathoth, and then they remember everything that happened, and even still remember the sound of madness still feeling the drumbeat. The Array's communion is going to happen again. People who died after the 1846 iteration are alive again, albeit with sand loss, though those who died or were injured before are still in the same health. Unless the agents stop the incursions, another iteration hits at 2203. Should the agents call for help? mentioning Azathoth or the Demon Sultan or perhaps dropping the name of the Mad Arab, Carpenter gets what's happening. It's a dire situation and a clear breach of protocol with her saying in a serious manner that it needs putting an end to. If the agent asks for it to be bombed out of existence, she says she will ask. Though Delta Green does have a lot of sway, Carpenter bombing a Chicago suburb is possibly a step too far. At 2057 it hits again. They find a moment of terror and they should all know what will happen in a further 65 minutes. At iteration 4, a perfect communion with Azathoth is reached, and reality vanishes in the horrifying monstrous forces that spawned it. This does not mean the end of the campaign. It suggests starting the next scenario with the agents waking up screaming in horror and the Olympian Holobium array was never even built, yet they have a deep memory of communion with Azathoth. It then moves on to how the agents should stop the incursions. The technologies at the array use otherwise unnoticed patterns of energy from Azathoth. D converts these patterns into a pattern that can be observed by humans. This connects the human brain to the demon sultan and is a live wire that draws psychic energy from the human brain, which brings Azathoth closer to physical reality. The agents can stop this by shutting down the array and the consciousnesses of the observers there. Klinger can come to this conclusion if the players don't realise it. If it's done before 1846, then that is the final pulse of contact from the array to Azathoth, and the energies and the strange tones build to a crescendo then suddenly stop. Takagawa will awaken, remembering a glimpse of a deeper reality, and never recovers from the injuries, mental or physical, that were received. If it is done 1846 to 2057, then a final pulse comes and there is a horrifying moment when reality gives way to Azathoth and San is lost, but then it vanishes. If it is done between 2057 and 2203, the agents can hear and feel the rising energies of the Demon Sultan's approach, catching a glimpse of the horror from a single endless moment before it vanishes. Azathoth leaves a severed extrusion of itself behind that crashes to earth, thrashing and demolishing the array, pursuing the staff there and then vanishing out of reality. The easy way for the agents to shut down the array is as simple as smashing D and damaging the atrium machinery. This maddens the staff there and they will physically fight the agents to stop this. They will instantly stop fighting should the agents stop trying to damage the array. Restrained staff can be talked back to sanity in a few minutes. Shutting down the array is traumatic to the person doing it as it feels like breaking a connection with the divine and San is lost. The staff here have private passwords in order to log into the atrium systems for maintenance and can be persuaded to shut down the atrium, though this may trigger violence from the others. D cannot halt the connection to Azathoth as it has bent its own processes to be able to achieve communion. Disconnecting D from the power does nothing, only destroying it or severing its connection to the array will work. This will not stop the incursion as such, only weaken them to begin with. D will continue to analyse data and presenting it to those who interact with it. Should the agents shut down the array but leave the staff untouched, the pulses continue to build towards communion, however they do take longer. The amount of participants with awareness of other thought needs to be reduced, this includes the agents themselves. This reducing of awareness ranges from knocking people out to killing them. It gives some numbers as to the amount of people out of action and each iteration time period and the effects thereof. 
Killing someone in cold blood has a sand hit and they can and will be prosecuted and imprisoned if they murder someone. It gives some sand gains for the things that they manage to accomplish and it can even salvage the technology for Delta Green though it could end up back in the hands of Olympian Advances Inc. It also includes the option of turning Tahagawa over to Delta Green for treatment. If they turn over Klinger, she is never heard from again. After this we have the characters from the scenario. A few handouts and a list of playtesters. With Observer Effect, a night at the opera definitely saves the best till last. I don't think I've ever read a scenario where the sense of impending doom was better realised than this one, and the Groundhog Day nature of reality resetting itself to cope with the unnatural incursion of Azathoth plays out beautifully. The scientists in the array are excellently realised, and the more events get crazy through the iterations, the more it feels like the agents lose control over what they can do to stop it. The array itself is far enough outside of a rural environment that what happens there can go unnoticed by the masses, but close enough that nothing drastic can be done, and D definitely has a HAL 9000 feel to it, though perhaps not as obstructive. And the slow-paced build-up to the realisation that they are dealing with Azathoth itself should produce horror, confusion and panic in equal measures. The use of sounds to show the rising cacophony of the glory of the Demon Sultan builds up to a wondrous crescendo that's sure to leave your players exhausted and just that bit thankful if they manage to survive the events that transpire at the array. The art, as per the rest of the book, is fabulous, though the maps not having any scale was a bit of an oversight, and I do think timing could be an issue here as there's a lot of set events that happen at certain times, but these are incredibly small complaints in the grand scheme of things, and none of them are even slightly show-stopping. I know somebody who played Observer Effect for Free RPG Day 2018 using the Cthulhu hack rule set, and was told it was a great scenario and an incredibly memorable experience, which showcases the fact that it is not a rules-reliant scenario and that great adventure design is just great adventure design, no matter what the system used. I find it difficult to believe that anybody could be disappointed if they played this operation, as it contains all of the ingredients that are quintessential to what Delta Green is. The hubris of mankind believing that there is nothing that they shouldn't attempt to understand. I give Observer Effect a 10 out of 10. So, a night of the opera as a whole. I originally scored Reverberations a 7.5 out of 10, Viscid a 9 out of 10, Music from a Darkened Room an 8 out of 10, Extreme Affilia an 8.5 out of 10, The Star Chamber a 9 out of 10, and Observer Effect a 10 out of 10, giving Rounded Down an average score of 8.5 out of 10. But this is not a score I'm going to give Night at the Opera. This book is a perfect example of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. As far as I am aware, Arc Dream Publishing never initially intended to release a collection of scenarios in this manner but it was something that the fans had been asking for, and so they did. But they didn't just compile them into a book. They made a genuine attempt to make them follow some sort of narrative order, setting out a timeline and adding in reverberations as a way of teaching new players some of the basic concepts of Delta Green. Those being that you can't win them all, and sometimes you have to live with the consequences of your actions. This is a superb collection of scenarios that have mind-bending metaphysical concepts, foul body horror, a classic haunting, terror on a cosmic reality-bending scale, and even a whodunit type adventure. For the genre space that it occupies, I imagine that a lot of tastes are catered for and should provide you with many sessions of enjoyment fighting the fruitless fight against the unknown. I give A Night at the Opera a 10 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos. Also, if you're interested in buying this product, I'll put some links below. Lastly, if you like what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon. But out.